thank you for coming. Thank you for having You've me. You've been on TV this morning. Yes, I just come from there. What yeah. questions did you get? Uh, you can imagine, but they asked about nuclear. Yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't have expected that. <laughs> and uh, then, of course, they also asked about the roadmap and what can we do and international negotiations. Mm -hmm. So probably some of the same things you will be asking. Uh, the commissioner was also, you can listen to it afterwards on Swedish radio, you were also at the Saturday interview, as we call it, Lördas interview on Swedish radio this Saturday. And if you want more on nuclear and the commissioner views on that, you can go in and listen on sr.se uh, after this meeting. Uh, we both work for the European Commission. And even though we, we know it quite well, you and I, it's still for some people an, quite an unknown institution. And I thought we would start by how would you explain the role of the European Commission and what is your area of responsibility? I mean, what powers do you have, let's say, in this area? Well, you could say the Commission has the power to come up with proposals. We can take the initiative, but we cannot dictate anything. Uh, in the end, we are very much in the hands of the member states. Do they want to accept this or that, or don't they? That's sort of, in the end, very much the democratic elected governments of Europe that would decide that. But of course, there is a huge power in, for instance, as we did now with the roadmap, saying we think that up to 2050, this is the direction we should go for. This would be some of the tools we could use. So, of course, there is a lot of influence there. And I would say that um, I have the portfolio of climate action, and that was a new portfolio. And the whole thinking behind it is that we should try to mainstream climate thinking in all sorts of policy areas, in transport, in energy, in agriculture, in the budget, in research, and so on and so forth. So my job might be slightly different because I do not have a lot of legislative things myself, but I have to, for instance, yesterday we presented a transport white paper. We will be very much involved in the, this saying, what could we do? So that is part of my job. But what very few people know, I think I didn't know it before I became a member of the commission myself, is that I would say that around one third of my time, I'm not dealing with climate related issues because the commission is a college and we decide everything all together. So for instance, last week we were discussing first the competitive pact up to the summit last week. Then we were discussing the situation in Libya and North Africa. And then we, we were discussing nuclear in the light of what is happening in Japan. And in all these areas, all commissioners will have to take part of this discussion. What to do with immigrants? What to do with Romas? What about divorce rules? You know, all that kind of things. All commissioners actually have a say. So in that sense, it's, of course, extremely challenging times because there are so many crises uh, around the world and, and in Europe. Uh, but also it's extremely privileged to be, uh, have the opportunity to have a say on all these different kinds of things. The European Union has adopted a new growth strategy called Europe 2020, and climate is integrated as one of the five headline goals. What does this mean for your portfolio to be part of the main growth strategy of Europe? How do you use that potential? I try to use it so that, for instance, we cannot make a transport white paper without our climate goals being reflected in this. Now, the next uh, year or so, what you will hear a lot about you know, when it comes to EU will be the EU budget. How could we uh, spend the, many, the, the money in the EU budget much more targeted in line with where our political priorities are? For instance, climate, energy, things like that. I mean, it's not enough to have it in a fine paper uh, as a priority, it must also be reflected in the budget. And for instance, when it comes to the agricultural subsidies, as some of you will know, it's 41% of the EU budget that goes for agricultural subsidies. Uh, one can very easily discuss the, the wisdom in this, but that is how member states have wanted it so far. But for instance, to say, shouldn't we get more added value out of this money so that we, through these subsidies, better improved our environment, better sort of made it possible for farmers to live up to contribute to solving our energy challenges and so on and so forth. So that would be some of the imminent things for the next year or so where you could say there it should be tested that it's not just a nice priority, a nice flagship. It also has really to prevail through all the policies and including the budget. Before I let you explain uh, the main building blocks of the roadmap 2050, can you just give us a little bit of the state of play on where we are in reaching the goals we already set 
uh, in the climate and energy area. I'm thinking about the 20% minus CO2 to 2020, the 20% yep. energy efficiency goal and the 20% on, on renewables. Where are we today? Uh, as it looks, if the member states do everything that they have said they would do, then we are very much on track to meet the 20% reduction in CO2. In uh, 2009, we had reduced 16%. That is the latest figure we have. Of course, it's a, a bit too good figure. That was because of the downturn in the economy in 2009. But still, we are very much on track there. We are also very much on track to meet the renewables targets of 20%. But the interesting thing is that we are on track to meet the target on renewables and on CO2 without being on track to meet the third target, namely the 20% improvement in energy efficiency. So that we are only on track to meet around 9%. So what we are saying in our roadmap that we will come back to is that if we actually delivered 20% in energy efficiency as the leaders, the heads of states of Europe confirmed as late as 4th of February that they want to, then that would bring our CO2 emissions reductions by 2020 not to 20%, but actually to 25%. So already there, we would sort of leave the 20% target behind us. We could go further just by implementing policies that we have already said that we want to implement. The title for today's meeting is uh, the Roadmap 2050. And you have said it's a little bit like a GPS now that we should follow for the future. It should sort of guide us. So what are the main suggestions that the European Commission is putting forward on how to reach a competitive but still a climate smart and CO2 smart society? What we have presented is basically an, an analysis. If we should deliver on what we have said for many years, we would reduce 80 to 95% of our emissions by 2050. What is then the most cost efficient way of doing that? That is one precondition that is in our analysis. It must be cost efficient. And the other precondition is we only work with known technologies. I'm looking forward to hear about some of the new solutions. We will need a lot of new solutions, but we have not come up with some fancy idea that nobody has ever heard of before and said, oh, if only by 2042 we invented this and that, then it all would be very easy. We have some technologies in there, for instance, CCS, carbon capture and storage. We should improve in, in uh, storage in, in batteries. Electrical vehicles, electrical transport will be part of our roadmap, things like that. But basically, we have said it's known technologies and it must be cost efficient. There, the main conclusion then was, if it has to be cost efficient, the 80% of the 89 to 95%, the 80% will have to be done domestically in Europe. Honestly, that is not what we have been doing so far. If you look at what member states have been doing, they have offset a lot of their emissions by buying projects in China, in India, in Brazil, whatever. There, the analysis shows two things. First, in 2030 and onwards, there won't be a lot of cheap offsetting in, for instance, China. Of course not. The cheap things, they will do themselves. They will not sort of let us get credit for doing that. So there won't be cheap offsetting. But the other argument is, if we agree that we should make this transition into a more energy efficient, resource efficient economy, isn't it then stupid to continue to buy a lot of projects outside Europe instead of investing in making the transition in Europe? So that is the one main finding, 80% is cost efficient to do at home. And then we have for the first time also not only uh, targets for 2020, but we also have milestones where do we need to be by 2030, where do we need to be by 2040. If you are uh, investing in these areas, you would know that 2020, that's just around the corner, you're already looking uh, further. So that is one thing. And the final thing is that uh, we have said it's not enough just to do this through a transition in the power sector, energy sector, and the industry. Other sectors will have to contribute as well, meaning transport sector, agriculture, and buildings. 40% of our energy in Europe is spent in buildings. That is one area where we could do much more by retrofitting our buildings, making them much more energy efficient. And the big advantage in that would be it would also create a lot of jobs in a construction sector where unemployment, generally speaking of Europe right now, is very, very high. So we try to prove that, or we prove that you can combat climate change, increase 
energy efficiency and make us less dependent on imported fossil fuels. And at the same time, if we do it in the right manner, it can enhance our competitiveness and our innovation. So it's sort of all these aspects together that is in the roadmap. If we take, for instance, the issue of buildings, what could the European Commission do concretely to increase the incentives for business and private and, and member states to actually change those windows or whatever? What are your tools in this toolbox for creating these incentives? Most of the financing there would have to come through private capital. It's nothing that would come through the municipality of Stockholm or the state finance of, of Sweden, or, and it cannot also come from sort of the EU budget. But the EU budget, of course, could, by giving priority, for instance, within what is called the cohesion funds, part of the structural uh, funds, there we could make energy efficiency, retrofitting of buildings, a part priority, so that the EU money, to a large extent, could be used as seed money for some of the private, for instance, the energy service companies and other kind of innovative kind of financing that is coming into this sector so that we could get it on a larger scale. But the irony around these things about buildings, for instance, is that it pays off. I mean, if I insulate my, my house, normally it will pay back in only three, four, five years. It's not a very long payback time. If um, you retrofit public buildings in Stockholm, the payback time will be equally short. But the problem is that the way we think our economies normally is on a year-to-year -year basis. What does next year budget say? And then whatever you do is a cost. And the benefits, they come in three, four, or five years and forever after. So we have to sort of change the way we discuss costs and investments. As I see this, it's very much a question of investing in a much more sustainable future. That was something you brought up in the, uh, on radio on, on Saturday. You got a question of, I mean, everybody reads this paper and it looks like, wow, it's a win-win for everybody. Just, you know, let's get going. Yeah. And still, it, that's not exactly happening. And one of the problems is this perspective, you know, thinking one year or thinking 20 or, you know, 40 years. Is there anything more you think that the European Union can do in promoting a long-term thinking and also then making these products that we're going to listen to yeah. you know, beneficial. Or we could be much better in Europe to work together on research and development. We could pool our resources much more when it comes to demonstration projects. We could also, as we did uh, together with the roadmap, uh, suggest that uh, each member state should retrofit 3% of their public buildings each year. That is now up to discussion with member states. Why don't we do it? It pays off. It will uh, diminish our independence of imported fossil fuel from Saudi Arabia and Libya and what have we. So that is just some examples of, of what could be done. But then I also think that we need this sort of, I mean, we have so many, many challenges at hand right now. So of course people could say, why bother about 2050? That we, we, we even don't know what to do with, with Libya tomorrow. I mean, what, what can we, how have this long time perspective and I think that we really need that in a global uh, era, in, in a, when we're talking about global challenges. We need to have a more long-term perspective. Can I just give you one example from our annual growth survey that we gave in the Commission, which should guide member states when they make their next budget? There, for instance, we said, isn't it stupid in Europe to continue to get so much of our tax revenues through taxing labor? Wouldn't it be much better, and we proved that it would be better for our competitiveness, if instead we got more of our revenues from taxing consumption, energy, and resources? We say we want people to work more, then it's not very clever to, to, to have world records in taxing labor. Whereas we want people to spend less resources, shouldn't we take care through the taxation system that it is attractive actually to save energy? So there are ways in the way we sort of have uh, constructed our societies that we could make the incentive even stronger for you and me as individuals to do the right thing and for companies to do the right thing. And one of the best carrots normally is if they can see it's very expensive not to do the right thing. So there we have a very strong tool that I think should be used more for the future. Commissioner, if students now university like to follow your 
work? What are the best means of knowing what is happening in the area of uh, energy and climate? Your website, blog, I mean, what would you recommend if we try to keep up with uh, what you're doing? One month from now, then try to follow me on Twitter, but we are just starting it. Uh, so it, you're probably not worthwhile be sort of the, the next few weeks, but of course our, our, our web page. But then basically, I mean, what we should all do, I think, is also through the media to take care that although this is old news that we have a climate change, change challenge, uh, the chance has not gone away. And it's incredibly important that everybody sort of tries to contribute to the debate uh, because in the end, politicians like myself, we cannot continue to keep this focus with citizens unless they actually understand why they should pay attention to something happening in, in the future. So that we need a broader debate, including good solutions that makes it clear to people that it's not about a gray and dull future, it's actually doable and it's just a question of creating a more intelligent kind of growth.